Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today afternoon. And today I'll speak on this theme of how actions speak louder than words and how sometimes they don't speak louder than words. See, there are many conventional sayings. Say, for example, it is said, many hands lighten the load. If you have to carry a big burden, you have many hands and lighten the load. But then you can have the opposite saying. Too many cooks, what do they do? Spoil the broth. So in one sense, you can have more hands together, it becomes lighter. Hmm. You can say that silence is speech may be silver but silence is golden. silence is golden that's true but if you have small children in your house then silence is not golden it is just fishy <laughs> what is going on <laughs> children are after some mischief that's why they're so silent <laughs> so there are many traditional sayings and they have their utility but it is not that any traditional saying that it does not have to necessarily reflect the entire reality. So, so similarly, I'll talk about this theme that when we are dealing with each other, how our actions speak louder than the words, but they sometimes do and sometimes don't. So I'll speak on 321 in the Bhagavad Gita. Yad yad archirati sreshtas. So I'll talk about this in three broad parts. About say, as, as, when, what do we mean by actions and what do we mean by words? And how words relate with actions? Then I'll talk about when actions speak louder than words. And when words speak louder than actions. So, <clears throat> Generally, reality is very complicated. Say, if we look at the map of the world. Now, if you look at... Oh, the okay, thank you. <laughs> so, if you look at the map of Australia, we might see very neat divisions. Okay, this is Queensland, this is New South Wales, this is the state, this is this province. But if you actually go over there, it's not that there's a neat demarcation. And this might be here or it might be there. So any kind of categorization that we do. Categorization, categories are basically conceptual tools. Which we use for gaining a grasp of reality. The categories are not necessarily intrinsic realities. Some categories may be, some may not be. So, so maps are a good example. Maps are vital for functioning. But the borders on the map are not literally borders on the ground. I just came from America. So the American president wants to make a literal wall, <laughs> you know, across Mexico. So now the, the kind of boundaries are very rare. China had a great China wall. But it's it's more of an artifact than a functional ball, boundary, functional limitation. So why I'm talking about this is when we talk about actions and we talk about words. See, our theme is, do actions speak louder than words? So, actions and words, are they really that distinct categories? Because at one level, words are also actions. When we speak, we are doing some actions. Speaking is also an action. And <clears throat> we interact with the world in two broad ways. The Bhagavad Gita says that there are the knowledge acquiring senses and there are the working senses. So, so right now, you are looking at me, I'm looking at you. So basically what is happening, you are acquiring knowledge through your eyes and through your ears. And simultaneously, while I'm sitting with my speech, I'm doing some work. Isn't it? Uh, teachers who, of any kind, when they, when they say I'm going for work, they're not doing any physical work, it's mostly speaking. So speaking can also be an action. Literally for some people, speaking is their work. For those who are especially in the teaching profession. But also, speech can also be an, an action in the sense that it initiates action. So this is a special kind of speech which is technically called as a performative utterance. 
performative utterance means if a judge says that let this person be sentenced to jail for 3 months then the judge's words initiate a set of actions because the judge is in a particular position which gives a particular power so the utterance leads to a performance just the utterance by the judge now if we say let you be sentenced for 3 months okay there will just be an utterance there will be no performance after that is it it so the utterance leads to a performance when the person uttering those words has some position some power so in that case the core the judge's words are also in action their action in the sense that they will initiate an action and in fact attorneys uh you call them attorneys here or lawyers or what is the word advocates different countries have different words what is it lawyers lawyers okay so lawyers their whole whole they are doing a lot of work which is speaking to get the judge to do some work which is also speaking so this neat categorization that actions and words when you say actions speak louder than words action words are also a form of actions and now why are we talking about all this because you know we often see in the world that often there is a distance between what people talk and what people do as they say walk your talk so one of the main reasons why people often turn off turn away from any kind of maybe spiritual or religious <coughs> path is because they see people not walking their talk somebody acts as if they are very spiritual but then when they are supposed to they they, they talk in a very spiritual way but when they are supposed to act then what happens their actions are almost completely opposite so <clears throat> in india one of the biggest uh, not in just in india in the world the biggest get together of the biggest religious gathering occurs once every few years which is that gathering kumbh mela so kumbh mela is literally it's like millions of people descend at one place so one of my friends had gone to the kumbh mela and he saw this priest who was chanting mantras in a very mellifluous expert way and then he was lighting a fire a fire is a means of offering a sacred sacrifice and then he finished chanting those mantras and and he lit the fire and then while sitting on that sacrificial fire itself he took out a bead bead is like a crude version of a cigarette and he took out a cigarette and then he put the cigarette in the sacred fire itself <laughs> and he lit it with that so with his mouth he is chanting a lot of sacred words but his actions are very profane so whenever we see any kind of a distance between actions and words when we feel appalled by it we feel this isn't work if we go to a doctor for treatment and doctor happens to be very sick then you start thinking oh, maybe this doctor may not be the best person for me to take <laughs> now, of course doctors can fall sick there's nothing there's nothing objectionable about that but if the doctor is sick with the same disease that we are having right now and the doctor's treatment does not worked for them then we may wonder should i actually take treatment from this doctor so generally speaking whatever we talk about we need to see it expressed in actions so especially it it, it applies applies in all fields but in the in the religious field often there is a lot of what is called moralizing you know do this don't do this and those who often tell others don't do this they themselves keep doing a lot of things like that so i i had just taken i had been in america for a interfaith conference in washington dc and there it was quite a candid get together by people from different religion and uh, there was a christian pastor who was talking about this 
is talking about how uh, that he was telling you know you lighter not he says we talk about how the love of jesus can unify the whole world yes it's that yes god's love is so great can unify the whole world but we talk about uniting the whole world but once there was a person who was walking along a bridge and he saw somebody on top of the bridge about to jump off into the river he said hey what are you doing he says don't don't die don't don't kill yourself don't kill yourself this says why nobody loves me nobody cares for me he says god loves you oh, how do you know that he said i am a christian so this person said i am also a christian oh god so which christian are you protestant or catholic he said i am protestant oh i am also protestant okay which denomination he said i am a methodist oh i am also methodist oh which part of methodist he says i am a southern methodist oh i am also southern methodist oh very good which southern methodist he says i am a reformed southern methodist jump down you pagan <laughs> jump down you pagan <laughs> so we will talk about unifying the whole world but sometimes our small differences they if we make that we escalate them to huge differences where there's a lot of intolerance because of that then people become quite uh, averse to it in fact one of the if you consider it's a certain government form or something where people put in if you are asked to put in your religious affiliation now one a category that is growing a lot in the western world is they call it as none none not this not this none so it's not atheism it is the technique as atheism and agnosticism what is the difference between the two atheist doesn't believe in god agnostic doesn't admit existence of god doesn't admit the existence or doesn't like neither yeah. it's like doesn't believe in higher authority or doesn't believe in oh, little yeah little you're on the right track anyone else it's agnostic it's agnostic is 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 like they are not convinced one way or another either on the existence or the non existence yeah agnostic means to no so agnostic means to one who says that it's unknowable whether god exists or not it's unknowable so that is agnostic what this this nuns they are not atheists they are not agnostics they call themselves as apatheists apatheists we don't care <laughs> <laughs> maybe god exists god doesn't exist i don't care about it so why this happens is because there can be many reasons but one major reason is when people see a lot of difference between how religious people what religious people teach and how they live so in that sense whenever we act in any way our actions do matter and they matter much much more than words so for example we all may have spiritual practices we might do our meditation we might do our worship we might uh, do whatever practices we are doing but the world doesn't care what practices we do the uh, what the world cares how we live how we behave when shri prabhupada was asked how can we know your followers he said they are perfect gentlemen and perfect ladies because if we consider our spiritual practices they are our personal spiritual practices and those different people may have different spiritual practices what, what do people care about it's like if you meet someone you want to see whether they are healthy now, okay what medication you took to become become healthy that's that's okay it's important but it's secondary so what we want people want to see is the actions the behavior so when there is a lack there's a big distance between actions and words then that often alienates others so and that's why actions speak louder than words and many people can attract others if simply they are well behaved if their actions match with their words then even if they speak a few words that can attract others so in principle we can say that actions do speak louder than words and sometimes the actions may speak so loudly that we can't even hear the words 
So some because we see their actions and that's all that we remember. But there are time, but this doesn't mean words are unimportant. So this ap applies to any area in our life, any area where we want to say improve ourselves. The Bhagavad Gita is at one level words which are spoken. The words are spoken and these words are what lead to a transformation in Arjuna. In the Ramayana, when Ram and Lakshman are searching in the forest uh, to find Sita and to find some allies who will help them to find Sita, at that time Hanuman comes over there. And Hanuman starts speaking and he speaks, he addresses them in such a sweet an attractive way that just by hearing his words, Ram tells Lakshmi, this, pers this person's words are so sweet. He must be a very learned and wise person. Just hearing the words of this person has pacified my mind. We can assume whenever we meet people, almost everyone is agitated by something or the other. One of the characteristics of today's age is that upadrutaha. Everybody is disturbed. So when we speak, you know, we can try as much as possible to speak to give others peace of mind. But often we speak to give others a peace of our mind. <laughs> and then people are agitated. And we agitate them further. And then just things become worse. So, when somebody can speak very sweetly. Now, sweet speech doesn't necessarily mean flattery. It doesn't mean uh, being manipulative. It just means whatever you're speaking, we speak in a way that is appealing. So, that itself pacifies the mind. That is so just as Ram says that, oh, I'm pacif I am so pleased to hear the way Hanuman is speaking. So similarly, for each one of us, actually how we speak also matters. So as I said, that actions do speak louder than words, but that doesn't mean words don't matter. Words also matter. Because as I started, it's not a rigid division. So how we speak, especially on the path of spiritual life centered on bhakti. In bhakti yoga, the idea is that we use all our abilities to connect with the divine. So our speaking is also a part of our abilities. And in that sense, we, if we say walk your talk, that's true. But in bhakti, talking is also a part of the walking. <laughs> so when we speak about Krishna, that is also, we are expressing, when we, uh, when we talk about spiritual subjects matters, talk about Krishna, at that time, we are expressing our words in a way that expresses our devotion. So the problem comes when talking is the only walking that we do. <laughs> talking is also part of the walking. But if talking is the only walking that we are doing, and not doing anything else, then it becomes a problem. <clears throat> so now words have... Why are words important? See, words have some very mysterious powers. In what sense mysterious? If we consider at a very basic level, words shape thoughts, words shape emotions, words shape desires. When we hear some commercial, we saw see some billboard. It's just words over there, words and images. But they shape, shape our thoughts, our emotions, our desires. So words can, you can say words shape subtle realities. If there is a physical reality, before the physical reality is a subtle reality. And words shape the subtle reality. Shape our thoughts, emotions and intentions as these grow towards action. Inside us, if we consider uh, before an action manifests, first a thought comes up. Oh, maybe. Let me think about it. And then it grows into a some emotional engagement. Hey, that's nice. It's good to have that. 
that's emotion and then that is intention i want this so much of this inner journey from thinking to desiring to intending that is often stimulated by thought words so words have this power to affect the inner world around us and then from that the outer world manifests and that's why for example many traditions have many people have this idea of affirmations now speak some affirmations and when you make the affirmations then they can they slowly get ingrained into us now of course i was at a conference on spirituality and mental health in america in connecticut so there we had a session on affirmations and affirmations also have to be such that they are believable it's in the affirmations uh, if our affirmations are about truths that we intuitively know and accept but tend to forget then those affirmations are are helpful so for example if we are stressed or distressed about something that then if we read some thought that suppose everything that happens may not be good but it can be for good hmm? things happen for a purpose everything that happens can be for good now this we we, we may have some sense yet yeah, this may be true so this kind of affirmations help us so where the words point us or remind us of a reality that we accept but we tend to forget but say suppose somebody is somebody like say 4 feet tall and they read an affirmation i am 7 feet tall <laughs> well that kind of affirmation is not only not helpful it can also be damaging so if the affirmations are about things which are not real are not just not real they are so obviously counterfactual then those affirmations do not help in fact some people have this idea that you just affirm whatever you want if you see a big house say i own this house <laughs> and you think i own this house and some people say if you just think strongly enough you desire strongly enough then the universe will conspire and your affirmation will become a reality well actually in fact uh, now of course any socio uh, socio economic issue has many sides to it but i was talking i was at the same conference so one uh, one presenter was making this interesting point that in 2008 when there was this global meltdown uh, one cause of it was unrealistic optimism because many people it all started in america with the subprime crisis where a lot of people bought houses far bigger than what they could afford and the, the all this purchase of the houses the banks said banks didn't even check whether these people can repay the loans or not we said we will repay it and it seems that this surge in people buying houses which they couldn't afford uh, corresponded with a put with the sale of a set of self help books which all centered on affirmation you just desire and you will achieve it <laughs> just desire and you will achieve it you buy this house and it will be yours well it was it will be yours but for how long <laughs> so what happens is affirm words can direct us toward reality but if the words are patently unreal then affirming those words doesn't change the reality so words are important now why am i talking about affirmations this brings us to in the spiritual path say when we chant mantras mantra chanting is also an affirmation so so words are themselves actions so for example when we chant some mantras we, we may spend, in mantra meditation we spend a significant amount of chant, time chanting the mantras but that is also an affirmation and what is the affirmation over there when we chant the mantra hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare so there is at one level are the names of the divine krishna ram and hare 
At another level, there is a mood in this. The mood is that this mantra chanting is meant to remind us its affirmation, O part, return to harmony with the whole. That we are all pa- we are all pa- are parts of something bigger than ourselves. And the chanting of the names of the divine is meant to remind us of the whole. And we chant them, these mantras, in a mood of service and contribution. They remind us, O part, return to harmony with the whole. O whole, please keep this part in harmony with you. So it could be an affirmation to ourselves or it could be a prayer to a higher reality. It can be seen in both ways. And when it is chanted in that way, such mantra chanting can have a profound effect in calming our minds. Not just calming our minds, but also cleansing our minds. Now, in our... So this is how words do matter. Now, another way words matter is that words... So I talk about... Uh, I talk this whole mantra chanting, I talk about how words shape our inner world. That's what I give as example. But words also matter because words often explain our actions to others. We might be doing what we are doing, but people want to know, what are you doing? When, she, when Shila Prabhupada went to America, at that time, people had no idea of what who Krishna is, what even people didn't have much, much of an idea of anything Eastern except for some Buddhism and some uh, oneness kind of meditation. So it is Prabhupada who spoke by which he explained what he was doing. So when he was... uh, For many people, when they see the deities, they think these are just decorated dolls. Why are you worshipping these dolls? So yes, that's what it might seem, but there's much more in that. And that needs to be explained. You know, we don't see things just with our eyes. Actually, we see things with the knowledge that we have acquired. There is perception and there is comprehension. And to go go from perception, perception means you see something, comprehension means which you and make sense of it, understand it. To go from perception to comprehension requires education. And that education often comes through words. Say suppose somebody is a is a, tr- a tribal living in some remote pa- remote place, unconnected with the world. And then they come to a city and they come to maybe the CVD, they come to the stock market. And there, there's a giant screen. And everybody is watching that screen. And then there is a graph over there. And I watching this line just crashes down. And this line on that graph crashes down. And everybody, oh no! Everybody starts despairing and panicking. And it's supposed to say, what happened? Just one line went down on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> now, the line went down on the screen, but it's not just a line going down on the screen. That indicates the prices have gone down. It indicates so many things. So, But from perception to comprehension requires education. And that education comes through words. Either somebody speaks and explains or we read something, which is also words. So words are needed to make sense of actions. Why is this person, why is this person getting so traumatized by seeing this line crashing? So we see, so this is also, so when we do something, when we are acting in a particular way, if people are not able to make sense of what we are doing, then actions won't speak louder than words. It is actions will only speak louder than, uh, speak loudly that this is a strange person. <laughs> it's a, it is a strange person doing something strange. We need words to explain what we are doing. And sometimes words can make help, words are vital to make sense of the actions. So words shape our inner worlds. Words also help the outer world to make sense of our actions. And apart from that, words also play an important role in bridging the gap between what we aspire for and how we live. This is, I'll conclude the talk with this. So there can be four 
levels in this. Let's say that means what we think and how or what we think, what we desire, how we aspire for and how we act. There is always a gap between that. And this gap is just a fact of life, but the gap can be at different levels. At the most extreme level, it can be simply hypocrisy. The person just makes a show of one thing and then acts in an entirely different way. Sometimes when people give spiritual talks, their talks are not just, especially in India when people do some Bhagavad Katha, they, along with the spiritual, they bring in all kinds, maybe some medical talk, some social talk, all kinds of things they bring in. So once a Bhagavad Kathakar, uh, a spiritual talk giver, he was talking and he said suddenly, sometimes when people are giving a talk, you know, some talks are like a, you could say like a jog. They are purposefully going. And some ch talks are like straws. This is just everything is toddling around. And some talks are like rambles. You don't know where you are going and where you are starting and when you are ending. So, when the, some talks are like that, so this uh, speaker went on a tangent. And in that tangent, he started launching a tirade on potatoes. <laughs> potatoes are so terrible. You know, they are, they, 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 uh, they cause this problem in the health, they cause this problem, this problem, this problem. Potatoes should never be eaten. That was his. Now, ironically, <laughs> after that talk, when the food was being served, there was potato vegetable. <laughs> the sabji was made of potatoes. And when they were serving food, then the person who was serving, he thought the speaker spoke so much about potatoes. I can't serve potatoes on the So then he served everybody around him, but he didn't serve that potato services. Then he went by, he says, Hey, why are you not serving this to me? He said, Just now you spoke about potatoes. So that is potato for the podium, this is potato for the plate. <laughs> <laughs> so, when somebody has no intention also of acting the way they are speaking, then that's hypocrisy. Where there's a distance and the only attempt, in this case of course there's no attempt even to conceal it. But it, all that they do is try to conceal the difference. But that's not the only way. See, sometimes it could be, one could be hypocrisy, so other could be just deference. Deference means out of respect for someone. We might So deference and discipline are two slightly related things. The deference may be more out of culture, where we are very angry with someone, but still we don't speak because we want to maintain some culture or discipline. Or sometimes uh, we want to maintain some culture or etiquette. And discipline is where we don't feel like doing something, but we know it is good for us. So we do it. Now all of us, we can't uh, see each other's thoughts. And that is a great fortune. <laughs> if we start and see each other's thoughts, desires, emotions, not even one relationship we could sustain. So you think like that about that's kind of, that kind of desires you have? We would not be able to sustain anything. So nature has given us some inbuilt buffer where we get certain thoughts, we get certain desires, but you know, some people they 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 are what is called poker faced. They they whatever they are thinking, you you can't sense it from their face. And some people their face is are not like a poker, they are like a mirror. So whatever is going on, if they are angry, it immediately comes out on their face. So either way, the point is that sometimes between the way we feel and the way we act, or the way we talk and the way we act, there may be a distance and that might be because of deference or discipline. And in that case, it's not hypocrisy. I am feeling very angry, but I will not act on that anger. That could be discipline. And that is desirable. That is healthy. Because in this way, we can avoid unnecessarily provoking people. So, when, now this, now discipline, 
can be done with a desire to actually control ourselves and to become better human beings a discipline can also be done uh, when in order to just find a more opportune moment to hit back at others mm-hmm. and it said that suppose somebody provokes us and then he start counting till 10 mm-hmm. so he start counting till 10 but when you come to 8 you suddenly hit that person <laughs> and they are not expecting it <laughs> so in that case there is no desire to control there is a desire to use control as a tool to get things to manipulate the other person that's different but in general there can be a difference between the way we speak and the way we act we may say that we should not get angry but still we get angry that is a natural human emotion but that's a part of discipline that's a part of dis- our differ- a differential culture and that can also lead to pu- that can gradually lead to purification and transformation so when in our day to day lives when we interact with each other at that time when we talk with people or when we interact talk as well as act with people you know we need to look at people's actions and we need we naturally look at people's words as well as actions but what is most important is to see what the person's overall life is because sometimes our our words may not be in sync with our actions and sometimes our actions may not one or two actions may not be in sync with our whole life everybody has weak moments in which they might do something wrong so when we look at each other the point of forming relationships with anyone is not so much to see through the other person or you know you speak like this but this is how you actually are the point is to actually see each other through life is a tough journey and in this tough journey we all need each other's help so if we start using oh you spoke like this but you acting like this and we use people's words to judge them for their actions are not up to the mark then that can alienate us uh, alien create alienation between us and them but if people speak in a particular way and they're trying to act in that way but we all struggle we all sometimes uh, falter but we again rise and we keep going onwards but when there is no intention at all that is it with respect to this point this difference between uh actions and words sometimes words can pacify others and when we even if we do something wrong then we speak words of pacification words of apology uh, and that helps in uh, that helps in rectifying matters but then there is weakness and there is wickedness what is the difference between weakness and wickedness Can you, like you succumb you can't help it but because this is you intentionally try to hurt someone yes exactly weakness is we could say uh more it's hot headed you get angry you just speak something that's weakness but wicked 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 whereas weakness is hot headed wickedness is cold blooded it's where a person systematically plans to hurt the other person so we could say inside us we all have our impulsive side which prompts us to this to this to this and then we have our conscience also we have our intelligence we have a conscience which tells us don't do such, don't act in such a way so so if the, basically the intelligence and the conscience they are like our inner compass which tells us act in this particular way don't act in that way and sometimes this inner compass goes off track that means the impulses rise and they overpower us but for a person when it is weakness as soon as they come back on track oh i shouldn't be doing like this they come back on track and then keep going for i shouldn't be doing like this but where is wickedness what happens is the intelligence and conscience they are completely overpowered they are as if non existent so anger when it becomes very solidified 
and fossilized it becomes hate and when a person is angry if they is outburst but afterward they are at least apologetic but when somebody is hateful then that anger is not only uh, kept there for a long time but it's also almost like treasured held on to and when there is wickedness then there is the whole point is not so much to not do wrong but it is to not get caught while doing wrong or to do wrong in such a way that the other person can't hit back so when there is when there is a distance between the words between how people are talking and how people are acting we can give others the benefit of doubt and say this is because of some weakness and then we help them to rise above the weakness as much as we can as much as we can but if it is because of wickedness wickedness means that they are not at all interested in changing themselves their interest is only in getting away with what they are doing then at that time the weakness should be reciprocated with forgiveness but to offer forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness if somebody if somebody the say if a terrorist has come to attack and the police is there and both the police has a gun pointing to the terrorist and the police say i forgive you the terrorist will take their gun and shoot the police at that time is it it you know when there is wickedness you cannot have forgiveness at that point so at that point we need to uh, uh, so when some how do we know whether somebody is simply giving into weakness or its wickedness it's again by the overall life that they are living if that person is genuinely apologetic and remorseful and trying to transform we can overall see that but if person simply trying to cover up justify and continue doing that and they focus not just on doing it but on making sure that next time they do it in such a way that nobody nobody catches them they conceal it and then they 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 act in a way that is hurtful that is hypocritical then wickedness we have to take some action to keep ourselves at least safe from that so it's like suppose uh, now somebody is ca- caught by a traffic cop because they are speeding the traffic cop asks did you see the speed limit so, i saw the speed limit i just didn't see you <laughs> <laughs> now when that happens <laughs> we might say it's funny but then they're thinking that actually the problem is not speeding the problem is simply getting caught while we are speeding so this can still be humorous it just it's a minor infraction but in that direction when somebody goes and doesn't feel that i'm doing anything wrong the only problem is getting caught while doing wrong and when that wickedness is there then it then we have to be very cautious at that time sometimes assertive action is called for so that we don't let ourselves get deluded overall when we are ourselves practicing spiritual life we we all have some maybe we have some traces of wickedness but what we have mostly is weakness and as we keep connecting ourselves spiritually with the supreme with krishna we start growing by that and as we start growing slowly we start overcoming that weakness and generally the best way to deal with weakness is not to focus on fighting against the weakness so our impulses come like waves of desires within us so now when a wave comes in it's almost impossible to stop the wave to stop being swept away from the wave also swept away by the wave but if we can have an anchor and we focus on holding on to the anchor if fight to hold on to the anchor then holding on to the anchor will ensure that we don't get swept away by our wave, by the waves so similarly for us our spiritual practices our connection with krishna is the anchor and if we can f- Uh, there are many ways in which you can practice bhakti yoga and connect with krishna but if if we find an anchor and hold on to that anchor then we'll find that we will be able to overcome whatever waves come up within us waves of impulses waves of anger and gradually the distance between our words and actions will decrease and when we are pure then we become transparent then our words and actions come in harmony that because at that time there is no ulterior motive there is no vested interest 
there is only the inner and the inner desire to serve and the outer expression of the desire to serve and that is when our life will become uncomplicated our life will become fulfilling and joyful so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of do actions speak louder than words and first i started by talking about how actions and words are not necessarily two distinct categories any mostly categories are often concepts like divisions of states there are no markers on the ground but so similarly words can also be actions it's like teachers when they speak that their, their work is to speak or words can also be performative utterances where based on the position of a person the words lead to some other actions and getting people to speak those words which are performative utterances can also be work like it is for lawyers to get the judge to speak something so then after understand that it's not so categorically different then we talk about when uh, wor- wor- actions do speak louder than words it is that especially whenever anybody talks about any kind of self improvement or any kind of uh, imp- high better way of living any kind of spiritual religious talks that's when if there is a big distance between what people talk and how people live then that alienates people i gave some examples of how i talk about pure pure practices but then somebody might be very impure in their living or somebody might talk about unity and harmony but then over small divisions there are small differences there can be very alienating very anti very great antagonism then that's this kind so often people are alienated because they see a, from religion and spirituality because they see a big distance between what people how people are talking and how people are actually living so actions do speak louder than words in the sense that when people see that somebody your spiritual practices are making you a better human being and they feel inspired to also adopt the spiritual practices they people can't see or they don't care what spiritual practices we are following but they do see how we are living then i talked also about how uh, there are times when words don't necessarily speak louder than actions because words also matter so i talked about how words matter first is that words shape our inner world no words can act words can shape our emotions intentions act, and eventually our actions words can also act as affirmations when they remind us of a reality that we accept but we tend to forget and then affirmations can be a powerful way of reorient our ac- actions reorienting our actions in harmony with truths that we do know so mantra chanting is also like a affirmation it's a prayer as well as affirmation then i talked about how words can also explain our actions to others we might do our own practices very nicely but if people don't understand that they will just think we are doing something strange so what we are doing we need appropriate words to explain and at such time when we are explaining our actions we need to speak in a way to give others peace of mind not a piece of our mind and then when uh, we conclude talk by talking about when there is actually a difference between what somebody is speaking and how they are acting so there could be various reasons because of that one for that one could be the person is hypocritical where they have no intention of harmonizing the two but they just making a show why it could also be because of deference or discipline because then they want to behave in a particular way but their emotions don't go along with that it's in the act so deference and discipline can be because of resentment or it can be with the desire for purification and transformation so the distance between our words and actions we can look at it uh, it can be because of weakness which can be overcome by gradual purification but if it is because of wickedness weakness makes us hot headed we do something wrong and then we regret why did i do that but wickedness makes us cold blooded where we do something wrong and then we we say, we congratulate congratulate ourselves for our cleverness in doing it and getting away with it so when there is weak, weak weakness there can be forgiveness when there is wickedness then there has to be some assertive action at the very least to protect ourselves but if we are doing our spiritual practices then those our weaknesses may attack us like waves in the ocean but our connection with krishna can be like the anchor and with that anchor we hold on tightly and we resist those waves 
waves of impulses and gradually as we become purified by the connection with krishna then we will rise we uh, will rise in our life by which our words and our actions will come together in synergy thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna any questions or comments yes please difference between our action and uh, words and action is is we consider that's how that's where our weaknesses lie and um, to navigate that path to actually advance towards matching um, our ideal it's, it's it's a very it's a very fine line because it's a bit like a horse race you push too much or you hold back too much it can be either in either way it can be damaging so our internal self talk the more we realize how short we fall of the idea the more we can become quite harsh on ourselves yet we if we if we are not critical enough we can also justify too much mm -hmm. so we either advance try to advance too fast or not or, or too little that's true yeah. so it's it's and it's a very intricate balance because it's different for different people so it's not like a set set of rules that's true so how do we navigate that to how do we try to get as close as possible to that ideal balance where we know how much to push and how much to hold back and then yes so how do we know how much to if we push ourselves too much then we will become too harsh with ourselves but if we don't push ourselves at all to bridge the gap between our ideals and our actions then we might just stay where we are yeah uh, that you could say that two broad principles one is that we need to accept our weaknesses it takes courage to accept our, admit and accept our weaknesses but it also takes courage to accept ourselves with our weaknesses so if we don't accept our weaknesses then we become like ego egoistic i am i am perfect people around me are the cause of the problem so that's not accepting our weaknesses but the other extreme is we don't accept ourselves with our weaknesses this is how i am and this is this is where i am at and that self acceptance if it is not there then it's like somebody who has sickness but they don't admit that they have sickness mm -hmm. or that 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 or they think that that sickness is fatal or the sickness is so terrible it can't be cured so the way to balance ourselves ba balance the between the two is that to treat ourselves like someone we care about See, we all all may have uh, we will all may have different uh, say degrees to which we give charity but there is one charity we all give very freely advice is it <laughs> so as now now of course we are not talking about advice here in necessarily like a, a moralistic way but suppose we had a friend whom we cared about and that friend was in the situation we are in now how would we deal with that person at one level there has to be some change some transformation but at another level there has to, for the transformation to go on encouragement also has to be there so sometimes some people need to be some people need to be pushed sometimes people need to be patted i couldn't tell them what it is good enough now. so if we just need learn to create the distance between ourselves between within ourselves that say i am the soul and i have this body mind as a resource so if we treat ourselves like another person uddhare atmanath manam natmanam avsadayet krishna says elevate yourself with yourself don't degrade yourself with yourself when we have that idea okay then we can ourselves find out okay at this point you know oh, i'm feeling very depressed i'm feeling very disheartened and then what i need is encouragement okay i made this resolution i couldn't stick to it uh, but at least i stuck to it for some time instead of thinking i failed in the resolution i stuck to it for one week i stuck to it for one month i stuck to it for so much time and i'm grateful for that so that's one way of looking at it 
so if we can observe ourselves from a distance then we can see when we need encouragement and when sometimes we need chastisement sometimes we might have made a mistake and we might just be at taking a very complacent attitude oh, it's okay it doesn't matter no it matters so if we can have that object that uh, that requires at least to some extent some amount of the mode of goodness where we are in a calm reflective frame of mind and we can look at ourselves say i'm sitting here right now through a thought exercise i can visualize that i am somewhere up there or i am in, in the place of the audience and how is this person speaking what is this person doing so we can through a thought exercise look at ourselves from that perspective and when we do that then we can evaluate and then by that we can learn to orient ourselves on the right path another thing we could do is if we have some close friend with whom we can talk we may not be able to talk about everything but if we make a particular resolution and then we struggle to stick to it then if we talk with someone then they can tell us oh okay this you know this i had a struggle i, I couldn't stick to it then they might hear us out and they might tell us you know okay but this is something which it's understandable the situations came up like that or they might say no this this was this is careless on your part you shouldn't have acted like this so that is also we all of us we are we are very social creatures and lot of our behavior is regulated by the feedback that we get from society and that is actually very important because otherwise our mind can give us so many options that we can get lost inside the head itself so having some kind of uh, structure in our life with the more the structure we have in our life the less the rupture the mind can cause in our life <laughs> so imagine if somebody has nothing to do throughout the day they wake up in the morning and they say, today my whole day is free what happens is during our free time our mind works overtime <laughs> so the mind is say okay come on watch this movie let's surf on this site okay look at this facebook and sometimes people might spend 12 hours this whole day they goes in the social media itself why wow. now that's like a rupture which is caused but why is it caused because there's no structure in there but there's structure okay in the morning i'm going to do this after night do this then i will do this then we have some responsibility that we have to do that also helps us to get out of our head so creating some structure that means even if i am not able to stick to this particular standards so it's not it doesn't have to be like one or zero okay even if i can't stick i want to be at this level but if i can't be at this level this is a level which i will still be at so even if you become disheartened we don't uh, let we don't just collapse completely and that's why having some amount of structure in our life is very important <coughs> nowadays a lot of people suffer from mental health problems and of course depression and things are very complicated but one one cause of depression is often that there is no structure in people's lives and then what happens their mind starts taking them on a ride and they just go off with the mind just keep going off with the mind if somebody is feeling depressed just they just decide to come out of themselves now do something for someone get out of your head and make it a discipline every day i will do this for this person just start off with that and that's not a sure cure for if somebody has clinical depression or something like that then some medication will be required but in general general depression it's get out of your head so we don't we don't have to become so obsessed with our ideals that we stop our daily life itself so if our life itself has a structure then that structure will also create some framework it's like say if somebody is walking on a tight rope and while they are walking on a tight rope if they fall if there's a safety net below and even if they fall they will not fall way 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 down so if our life has a structure and within that structure we are trying to follow some high standards say say so suppose somebody decides to fast say recently we had this nirjal ekadashi you know we we tried to fast even without water now if somebody decides i am not going to fast okay i want to fast but i can't fast 
but if they don't fast if they're still in the community of devotees their family is spiritually minded then even if they take some food they'll just take some ekadashi food but somebody might say i want to fast i can't fast if they are very new and their association their the association is not very structured and they decide to fast and they can't fast and then they go out and drink and they take meat and they just crumble down to the bottom of a valley because of that so we need a structure which creates a basic framework for our life and we we can walk on the tight rope we can try to rise above that structure also but we shouldn't get so caught with watching with uh, trying to walk the tight rope that we we don't care for the structure at all so we maintain the structure like the safety net below and then we can try to have our our our, our higher standards above that but that's your question okay any other questions or comments Yes, please. Like you said, wickedness and weakness. So take it in a relationship, like with parents or your siblings. So, like you know that you are, you are not weak. Like I won't call like that situation weakness, but out of respect, you are not saying something. Mm. But then the other person keeps attacking, attacking, and that. Like if we don't, re- if we react, then it will be a Mahabharat. Mm. But if we re- the, if we stay quiet, so we are not weak, but it is considered weakness. So how do you, like you said, to anchor the Krishna okay. channel? But even if you try to do it, like in practicality, it doesn't work. At that time, you forget everything and like don't know what to do. And That's so true. what do you say? Yeah. If uh, some people, we are not weak. but if somebody keeps uh, exploiting or dominating us hmm. and then if we don't do anything they treat us as they treat us like as if we are weak they take it as weakness then what do we do yeah it's um, we all need to be clear about what are small things in our life and what is a big thing see that means that if something is very important for us we all have different relationships and different relationships are of different levels of importance now importance can be of various as sometimes some person is emotionally very important for us some person is practically very important for us whichever way it is but if at least we have a hierarchy within us clear this is more important and this is less important and in life we always have to we always have to negotiate that means say for example now i have this program after this program somebody wants to talk with me now i may also want to talk with them but if i have another engagement after this another program then i may decide i can't talk right now this is talking with uh, talking here is also important but going there also is important now if that is a engagement many people coming up then i may say i have to go there there is another engagement which can be postponed and this is a very important meeting i might decide this is more important so i'll push this off for a little bit so now this is very difficult to decide on the spur of the moment sometimes we may have to but in general we need to have some framework to decide if we don't have anything to fight for it's not that we'll stop fighting if we don't have anything to fight for we will fight for anything <laughs> that's how it works cuz our mind doesn't have a sense of perspective so sometimes some people might just uh, some people are you know, by their nature itself they are irritable hmm? it's not it's they're, they're not they're not necessarily bad people but just the way they talk it's like researchers say there are 10 10 million nerves in our body and some people seem to have done a phd about how to irritate every one of those nerves <laughs> so now when that happens if that's just the way they are and we may occasionally interact with them and whenever they interact they are like that we might just decide i it doesn't matter it's is ir- irritating but it's okay i can bear this that is just the way they are and trying to change them or trying to get back at them it's simply going to be like uh, wasting our energy mm. so then okay it's it's 
it's something which is uncomfortable but it is not unbearable so let me just live with it but sometimes it may happen that they treat us like that and what happens if everybody starts treating us like that oh this person does it like that and others also start doing like that then what is happening is then a particular perception of ours is formed that you can just walk over this person then we might decide you know, that there are areas which are things which are important for us and there we need to take a stand so it's not so much whether per people perceive me as weak or not if we start worrying about that oh if if i if sometimes what happens when there's negotiation then sometimes some people this is not really important but if i take a step back now then everybody will think that everybody will think i was defeated and they don't step back and they refuse to step back not because the thing is important but just because of the perception so we shouldn't be so perception driven we need to be purpose driven so purpose driven means that we ourselves understand this is important for me and in this particular role in this particular responsibility in this particular area i can't step back because this is vital for me that even if we have to alienate someone for that even if we have to sometimes uh, get into a conflict for that we can get into that but that should be based on uh, our our purposes our hierarchy of what is important were you there for that i had done a seminar last time on burn anger before anger burns you yeah. so then i think i gave that example of a car of a train if you are driving in a train you know if if you are traveling in a train and somebody comes along and it's, it's a crowded train and that person starts pushing us and he thinks you think you are a bully i'll push you back and we push them back and they push us and we push them back and we get so caught in pushing each other that our station comes and goes <laughs> and you are still pushing <laughs> yeah that would be childish okay you want to you, you want to show off your strength this is a short by 30 minute journey i'll just stand somewhere else the small thing keep it small but if somebody start, is not just pushing us but they are pushing us out of the train itself then it's not a small thing then it's a big thing because it's coming in the way of our getting to our destination then we have to we have to take a stand so i think if we we are clear about our purpose about what is the big thing for us then we will know when to when to take a stand and when to let things pass okay thank you any other questions Yes, some questions. So, thank you very much. La Prabhu Pa de ki, Gaur Bhakt Vrind ki, Gaur Premanand. Thank you, Prabhu ki. Thank you.